Thank you all. It's a pleasure to be here and support Ravenpack. Um, what I want to do today is talk about a specific use case that uh, we've been working on uh, in EMEA over the last couple of years. But underneath that, it gives um, a demonstration of the need for flexibility that we're going to need going forwards, not only for the massive compute um, uh, resources that we need, but also the flexible data architectures. So with that, um, I'm going to talk about the typical risk pipeline that we see in many of our customers in financial services industry. Um, this will be familiar to uh, many of you who work in front office. We have a scenario generation layer, a data fetch layer, pre-processing, calculation, and then aggregation and reporting. And this hasn't changed for uh, perhaps 20 years. Um, the HBC compute components of this is particularly interesting. So in the early t uh, 2000s, this may have been uh, the PCs running on the traders' desktops used overnight to do Monte Carlo calculations because they were doing nothing else, right? So it was useful to soak up the compute there. Um, as the computational uh, models grew in complexity and the requirements grew, this shifted to large Linux server uh, um, um, resources in the data centers, many thousands of Linux servers running through the night to uh, do these calculations. And this is all pre sort of the latest uh, round of regulations that have come through. And so we're starting to see a number of changes in this environment. If we just look at the sort of typical um, overnight runs, this would be sort of what a bank was doing uh, for many years. Uh, end of day, uh, the infrastructure would grind all through the night, producing the um, information that's required for reporting next day. You had one run at it, okay? So if it didn't run, you didn't get your results back, you had a problem. You, you didn't have the bandwidth uh, next day to rerun it, you'd have to wait till the next evening. And you couldn't run different scenarios. It was a sort of a one-shot type situation. So what are the challenges? What's driving the industry forward from the status quo of where we've been for many years? And you know, some of these environments are 20 to 30 years old, not quite as old as mainframes, but they're getting there. Well, it's several things. Um, regulatory requirements are forcing a change in the industry. So FRTB, for example, um, typically we're seeing it drive between ten, two to tenfold increase in compute horsepower needed for doing the calculations in this area. And there are a number of other regulations flowing through as well. And also the regulators would like the scenarios to run in a shorter time frame, uh, perhaps intraday even. And so these things that we can see on the horizon coming forwards uh, and starting to get sort of the uh, financial services organizations we talk to thinking about where to go next. Increasing market volatility, okay? So uh, it's been extremely volatile in the COVID period. There have been uh, bouts before, but during COVID, you know, there were a number of organizations that had the risk systems fail. They just couldn't keep up with the changes in the market and couldn't calculate. The other problem we have is skill set shortage. In the same way that mainframes and COBOL engineers are a problem, um, the skill sets for running um, large grid infrastructure on premise is starting to become a problem as well. The resources are becoming increasingly rare to find. The on site resource is fully depreciated now. So, you know, do we buy new or do we move to cloud? And we want to get rid of our um, data center facilities. And all of these things are driving us towards the cloud. Here's just a plot of volatility, by the way, from 2001, 2020 dot com crash, uh, FSI crash, COVID. Um, you know, volatility is certainly not a problem all the time, but when it hits, it hits, and you need extremely elastic infrastructure to cope with this. The other thing that we need to bear in mind when we're thinking about where we want to go as well is that a number of the organizations have very short task durations when they're running these calculations. So unlike uh, perhaps, perhaps climate models where you know, the agents will run crunching through uh, calculations for a long period of time, some of these calculations they're trying to distribute um, across a, uh, cloud, uh, an infrastructure or cloud infrastructure only take one or two seconds to run in some cases, and this has implications for the underlying um, sort of architectures that we um, have to provide. So we need throughput. We need lots of throughput. Um, you know, um, organizations need to run perhaps 300 million tasks in a night. Uh, if that's a 10 hour window, you're looking at over 8,000 tasks per second throughput within a modern grid environment for a tier one bank trying to run these sorts of scenarios. And if you try and pack the tasks together to create smaller, bigger jobs, 
we hit problems because statistically we don't know what the makeup of that um, long job is. Is it, uh, have we packed 10 tasks together which each take 15 minutes, and so are gonna cause an overrun? Or have we packed very short running jobs together? And it's very difficult to determine up front you know, the runtime for each one of these atomic elements before we pack them. So we really need throughput at scale to address these sorts of problems um, in, in, a, in a simple way. So AWS have many services, and there are several we could think about using. Um, Amazon Kinesis is a uh, streaming infrastructure which has very high throughput and low latency, which is very useful. The problem with that is horizontal scalability. If you've got hundreds of millions of tasks that you need to calculate, that's not the sort of service that you're going to use to achieve that. And the same with Amazon EMR. Well, that's used for calculating perhaps uh, liquidity risk and, and credit risk and these sorts of things by some parties. You can probably scale out to of the order of a thousand nodes with this before you start hitting um, the upper limits of the architecture. And in many occasions, you want to burst out further than that, more rapidly than that. And so HTC is a project that was put together by the European field team at AWS to address this particular niche in the market. So what's HTC all about? Well, it stands for high throughput compute. So whilst originally it was targeted at uh, front office, it's anywhere where you need flexible uh, infrastructure with a pool-based calculation type approach to that. So the idea was that the algorithms that are deployed to HTC are unchanged. So you don't have to change the algorithms that you're gonna run. And by removing the middle layers of the infrastructure and running on cloud native services, we can drive down cost. And you can also run on flexible compute resourcing models like spots and uh, on, on demand and these sorts of things. And of course, by moving to the cloud, it opens up a diverse range of compute silicon for you. You can stay with the AMD and the Intel that you're already using on premise perhaps. Or if you want to do a recompilation, you can move to the um, Graviton 3 or even FPGA type approaches, depending on where you want to go. But all of a sudden, there's a choice, a selection of uh, future possible silicon to run upon, which was denied to you when you were on-premise previously. The project's open source, so you can go to the GitLab site here, pull it down, have a play, run it up yourself. So what were the design tenants behind HTC? Just to touch on these very briefly. So cloud native, we're not going to reinvent the wheel. People do that all the time. We've got perfectly good wheel, the spokes in the center, uh, the, the, the axles in the center and all the uh, spokes are, are the right radius round it and the wheel's round. So we're gonna use the cloud native services that have been there for a long time, that are robust, uh, that have been battle hardened, that are used by Amazon themselves. Scale and low latency. So we need to scale out to tens of hundreds of thousands of containers as fast as possible in a burst type environment. And low latency, whilst not real-time streaming, we want a ability to, from injection of a calculation through the infrastructure and back out again, achieve latencies of about 0.1 of a second. And if we can do that, then calculation tasks of two to three seconds are going to be fine because the infrastructure latency is way down compared to that, um, compared to that uh, calculation uh, uh, cost. And high throughput, we need to be able to achieve at least 10,000 tasks per second to hit the sorts of uh, problems that our customers are sort of looking to address. From a customer perspective, it's got to be very simple to re-platform. So we need to preserve APIs that they're familiar with. So if you're using a third-party grid scheduler on-premise or some open source scheduler, the API we present shouldn't be too different to allow you to simply re-platform. This uh, idea here, all computers Lambda, is quite interesting. So what we mean here is that the task API in this environment is the Lambda API, okay? So this is normalized uh, API that your tasks uh, are, are using, but it doesn't mean we're using the Lambda service. The actual backing implementation can be anything you choose to use, as we'll look at in a minute. Modular, so we want it to be flexible so you can combine and change things to meet your particular workloads and your particular requirements rather than just giving it and say, there you go, off you go, and if you want to do something else, start from scratch again. And on demand, so if you've got a desk or a power user or a particular workload type, spin up an instance of this, scale it out, do your calculations, turn it off again, you're done. 
So rather than the old world approach where this stuff's sitting in the data center, humming 24-7, just use it when you need it and turn it off again. That's what cloud's all about, right? So here's a high level architecture overview of what we ended up building. And I won't go into the details of it, but it's basically four primary blocks within the architecture. The client connector side, the control plane, all using standard Amazon services, the compute back plane, and here you can see the idea of pluggability. So we can plug in and out the particular implementations that you want to use. So if you are using Kubernetes, you can plug in the EKS variants of this architecture. ECS, you can plug that in. It's the same with the data plane as well, which is probably quite important for the massive data sets that you might be looking at if uh, you're trying to analyze the sort of things we were looking at earlier today. So if a workload is cost sensitive, you're probably going to want to use S3. Okay, so you can configure the infrastructure to use S3, and you'll get a solution which really drives down on the cost of that particular workload type. But other workloads may be much more performance sensitive, and that is a higher factor in your considerations as to how to configure the architecture. And so there you may use Amazon Elastic Cache, or you may go for FX Fuluster, which is our distributed HPC file system. The important thing is that you can configure this per workload type. So you're not restricted to a particular, this is how it works, here you go. It's flexible and depends on the sorts of workloads that you have today and what you might have tomorrow. So evolvability uh, and agility. I'm not gonna talk you through that. Okay, here's, here's some scaling numbers for you. So um, just to give you an example of how flexible this architecture is, we can scale out currently to 80,000 containers in 15 minutes. Okay, so that is quite a uh, ability to burst out workloads, calculate, tear them down again in a way that hasn't been possible previously. Another thing which starts to uh, fall into place is the relationship with this with cloud infrastructure in general. So in um, typical grid solutions on premise, you'd have chargeback infrastructure built into the product. Uh, which would charge back the various groups that put workloads in. And of course, we don't need to do that uh, in this environment because we can leverage the cloud chargeback mechanisms that are uh, provided. If I just click on that, that cost center is going to flow back to equities because these services have been instantiated in the equities account on AWS. The other thing I just wanted to show on this slide is obviously here we've configured two versions of HDC. One line of business equities is using uh, equities quantlib, on ECS, fixed income for some reason, don't want to do that. They're using the fixed income quant lib libraries, obviously, but they're using Kubernetes. The point being, you can, the, the infrastructure can be flexible for the business units. The business units aren't constrained by the infrastructure. Data affinity is always an interesting um, area and topic. And in monolithic grid environments, this results in normally trying to root workloads to compute nodes that have already calculated previous instances of that workload because they've got affinity with pre-cached data. With HDC, you don't do that because actually what you can do is spin up particular HDC service instances for the workload type that you're going to inject. And so the data affinity in the top is already set by the first workload which goes through the environment as for the second and as for the third. So Affinity can be as a function of the service instances you're creating. And you can pre-cache that before you start your workloads or let the first job run through, create the affinity for you and submit all future workloads to that pipeline. Okay. It is production. We have a number of banks using this now who have moved to the cloud, dropped their uh, previous workloads, which ran all the way through the night to two hours, so a five times contraction in um, uh, runtime for the workloads. And of course, they get access to a whole range of silicon that they didn't previously have access to. Hopefully, we'll have some uh, um, PR stories coming out on this in due course. So where next? This is just a step. I've been talking about replatforming. I'll finish off very quickly, uh, last couple of minutes, uh, on re-engineering. So we're starting to see organizations think about, OK, where to go in terms of um, over the horizon type engineering for these sorts of risk workloads. One of them is SageMaker, AIML. Uh, so some of our European 
customers are using advanced machine learning approaches to train the scenarios up front as an input to the Monte Carlo simulations that they're running. And they've done um, a number of uh, articles on this in Risk Magazine, and you can go and find out uh, fr from, uh, if you search for Risk, AIML, um, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll find these customers. Uh, another area is quantum computing. People are playing around with that. To be honest, it's not really production yet, but people, you can find minima in complex data sets very rapidly. The problem is that you found the minima, okay? You don't know the resource landscape around that minima. And so what's happening is organizations are starting to use a combination of techniques, so perhaps quantum to find the minima, and then traditional Monte Carlo to step around that in the local environment to work out how deep or how flat the train is around that minima. And so we're definitely seeing hybrid approaches. Finally, just new algorithmic techniques. So some of you may have heard of uh, AAD, adjointed differentiation, can make between 10 and 100 times increase in calculation throughput, and also operator overload, where you actually walk out the graph of the algorithm, pre-calculate everything that's required up front, and then again, you can get huge increases through. And all of these will compress down the scale out required increase the throughput required, but also allow you to run intraday more frequently. And so we expect that over the next five to 10 years, we're gonna see these sorts of workloads running almost near, not real time, but on demand by the trading desks or the other parties in the organization when they need to know either the risk position of the company or a particular set of portfolios or whatever. And so it's, a, it's an ongoing story. And with each one of those steps, as always, we're looking to drive down the actual cost of infrastructure. Moving from on-premise to re-platforming can save you over 50% in terms of compute infrastructure costs. And again, moving to some of these more advanced sort of techniques I've just mentioned on again would significantly push this down further.